Welcome to the All Things Nintendo podcast. I'm Brian Shea from Game Informer, and this is a weekly podcast to discuss all the biggest news and games in the world of Nintendo. Speaking of the biggest games, it is finally here. We are going to go off script this week. We're not going to have any news. We're not going to have any eShop Gem of the Week. We're not going to have any definitive ranking. We are just going to focus this entire episode on The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, which is out on Switch today. And I think this episode might actually be a rarity because it features not one, but two people who have not only played Tears of the Kingdom, but have rolled credits on the game. Joining me today is the reviewer of The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom for Game Informer, Kyle Hilliard. Kyle, how are you doing today? I'm good. I swear to God, you better be actively playing Tears of the Kingdom while you're listening to this podcast. Like, why, don't do something else and listen to this podcast un, uh, other than play Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> I actually disagree because I do not... The only time I put a podcast on when I'm playing Tears of the Kingdom, or Breath of the Wild for that matter is when I'm cooking up a ton of recipes and I'm just like having to stockpile my my recipes because I oh, love geez, the how long are you sitting there cooking? I mean, I would just I would cook maybe 30 meals on end. Like I would swing by a it's cooking station idea, and just and just be like, all right, I'm going to stock up on like heart restoring or like cold resistance. But uh, yeah, that's the only time I will do podcasting and, or listen to a podcast while I'm playing either of these games. I guess I guess what I'm getting at is like I hope you're not listening to this instead of playing Tears of the Kingdom. Is hey man, is what I'm getting People have places to at. drive. People have chores to do. That's the, true. That's a those good dishes point. aren't going to yeah. do themselves. And yeah, maybe I've this is a good companion. Yeah, hard way. <laughs> Kyle, I've got to ask you. Yeah. You have played this game for eighty plus hours now. You yeah, have yeah. talked about it on the Game Informer show. You've written a review. You uh, wrote up a tips guide, which is on GameInformer.com right now. You appeared on MinMax, and now you're on all things Nintendo to talk about <laughs> Tears of the Kingdom. Are you tired of this game yet? No. What? God, no. Not at all. I. It's so crazy. Like, I was playing this morning i was capturing a bunch of footage which was like i i specifically made it like spoiler free tips footage so i like equipped link with like the starting outfit and took away all his weapons and stuff and all the other elements that would be considered spoilers and even just walking around it's like okay i need a footage of me using a scent i need a foot some footage of me like picking up bright bloom seeds in a cave i like ran across like three shrines i hadn't found yet and i was like oh i want to go do those but i, I need to get this footage <laughs> captured and it's uh, it's just constant like i every time i start like 80 hours in i've got like I've got one full row of hearts and then like five or six additional hearts on the second row and my stamina is all maxed out and like so i'm pretty deep into it but i still like am getting distracted constantly if that makes sense right like every time i go anywhere i'm like oh well, what's that over there i gotta go check that out you know what i mean like mm -hmm. it's it took like breath of the wild like you hit a point like very late in the game where you do end up finally being focused on maybe a single task that you're trying to finish right because you found like all the shrines you're not getting distracted by other things but like I, I still don't feel like I'm close to that at all. Like I just, I, I am constantly jumping around between tasks because everything is just so freaking interesting everywhere. So no, I, I am not tired of talking about it. I, I love this game, man. I, I, I can't wait for more people to play it. I can't wait for like, um, I don't know, three weeks from now when a, a lot of people have beaten it and I can talk about my trajectory through the game, which like even with you who have finished it, I'm not quite ready to talk about like how I approached the whole thing because I don't want to spoil elements of the game that you haven't touched yet. And that is something that I do want to get off right off the bat here is we are going to talk about our impressions of the game, full in-depth impressions as two people who have beaten this game, rolled credits, but we are going to remain as spoiler free as possible. Um, you know, there's going to be little things here and there, like Kyle's mentioning of the existence of shrines in this this game, which uh, prior to this, Nintendo has asked us not to talk about uh, prior to the review period anyway, which is now and prior to the game being out, which is now. So <laughs> we're able to talk about that now. But, um, you know, there are going to be minor things about like the structure of the game. But as far as the story is concerned, we're going to give our impressions but we are not going to talk at length about any spoilers. So if you're here without playing the game, which I'm assuming you are, or at least very early on in the game, you are going yeah. to be safe um, at, within a reasonable 
distance, I would say. Like, you're, we're not going to go out of our way and be like, oh, can you believe this happened? Like, no. no. That, and and, and that's like, that. and, and that's not like a directive from like Nintendo or anything. Like, I, I hope that you can have the experience that Brian and I had, which is like knowing very little uh, going into this game. It really helps the experience. It makes it even better to not know. Yeah. And I mean, I, I played Breath of the Wild on launch day. I did not play it prior to launch but with because i you know i just didn't have a switch prior to launch because it didn't it yeah didn't exist. It, was, it was pretty rare uh for like i yeah for it was reviewers basically people reviewing the switch who were also reviewing zelda were the ones that got it you know early mm-hmm. so this was my first time playing a uh, i guess a full scale zelda game prior to launch and you know it's uh it, it's very intimidating because the process is, you know, we approach these games sometimes before launch and there's no one to help you unless you like want to like email PR and be like, hey, like I'm stuck on this puzzle. Can you tell me where to go? And they can reach out to the developers and get like a comment. But like 99% of the time, we don't do that. 99% no, of the time we're like, yeah. hey, we don't we don't want to do that. Like, it's, I think I've done that twice in my career where it's like, not, not for a Zelda game, but like for a game in general, when I'm reviewing a game and I'm just like, Hey, I'm stuck. There's no guides on game FAQs or there's no like yeah. Reddit threads of like, Hey, I'm stuck on this. How do I fix it? Like if you get stuck in a pre-release game, you've got to just figure it out. And that was really intimidating for me with this game, even though I wasn't reviewing it, I still wanted to get through it prior to this discussion and prior to, uh, and a conversation that I, I just had prior to getting into this this uh, recording, which which we'll re- reference probably a couple times throughout this episode. I just got off a call with uh, Eiji Aonuma and Hidemaro Fujibayashi, who are the producer and director of both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, respectively. So I wanted to finish. Yeah. The By game the way, Brian, did did Onuma ask a, about me? He did, did not. He, he didn't bring me up. I brought you up, and he said, "I don't want to talk about that guy." <laughs> F that guy. <laughs> no, he's he. Uh, you know, we had a great conversation. We'll we'll talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I want to hear about it. I don't know anything about it yet. That's I'm excited to hear. But, what he's um, saying. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it, it, this was a particularly daunting task going into this game without any kind of safety net, really. Of like, yeah, which I mean, it's it's like I don't want to talk about it too much because it's not really a, an experience that a lot of people can have. But I relish that opportunity. I love, I loved like kind of not knowing where to go and being like i can't i don't i can't talk to anybody i know i can't I, there's no temptation to google because i can't and i and i encourage you to try to approach it the same way like don't google if you can resist you know it's like it's 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 which is hard when you're really hitting a wall but it's so uh fulfilling to figure something out on your own you know Oh, it yeah. I mean, there were a couple of times in Breath of the Wild that I definitely gave in to the temptation of Googling something like, for example, the uh, the Master Sword stuff in Breath of the Wild. I definitely Googled that and I feel like I shouldn't have. Yeah, it, no, it's tough. And like, no shame, obviously. Like there's it, there's also an advantage of not getting frustrated with a game. Like, absolutely. I totally get that, you know, but yeah, uh, it's a weird it's a weird way to play the game, but I really love it. Yeah. I think the last time I felt this kind of intimidated going into it, and you also have made this illusion as well. Portal 2 was the last time I was just like, oh, my God, I I don't have access to any kind of strategy guide. I, I have this before launch. Oh, sure. What if I get stuck? Because there are some clever puzzles in both Portal 2 and this, you know, like there's there's I think there's some parallels. I drew some parallels to it in my hands on preview where I'm like. I feel like I kind of have to rewire my brain the same way that Portal 2 required me to rewire my brain and like thinking through some of these puzzles. And I think you've drawn that parallel to like the Portal franchise with Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah, I think that's a this is a great sort of place to talk about uh, Ultra Hand, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I even I even said it as much in the review um, in that uh, Ultra Hand, I was kind of intimidated, intimidated by going in. Um, but by the by the end, and and to be clear, I'm still playing and will continue to play for a long time. I'm sure I have not seen all this game has to offer, but it really ultra the way Ultra Hand kind of breaks your brain to reconsider how to approach gameplay hurdles, mechanics, and things like that. You're right; it does remind me of the first time I played Portal, where you're like, you kind of have to rethink how you move through 
th- three dimensional space mm-hmm. and like portal i love portal and one of the like the highest compliments I, I can give that game and then i mentioned this i said this explicitly in the review is like i i dreamed about portals when portal and portal 2 came out i would have dreams that portals actually existed and i would dream about using portals and i had that experience with ultra hand specifically in tears of the kingdom like it might be <laughs> it might partly be due to me just like feverishly playing this game and not sleeping much i would stay up very late to play and wake up early to continue playing because i'm an insane person but i would dream about ultra hand i would dream about picking up objects and rotating them and connecting them together and it's like and if that's not like a selling point for you to like get excited about this game or maybe you're already playing like that's the fact that it invaded my unconscious brain i mean says everything you need to know (laughs) know? i mean i I had the same experience where i was like when i wasn't playing the game i was thinking about like oh what if i did this combination of like yes yes zonai devices and like putting things together in this way like what would happen there and then i try it and it would fail miserably like i actually recorded a couple of my more hilarious mishaps with like what if i did this and then it just blows up in my face i have some of those too yeah which i won't share for a while because they're just kind of inherently spoilery but like Mm -hmm. yeah i i I hope to put together like a little montage of just like absurd stuff that happened to me (laughs) yeah i mean i could absolutely contribute to some of those as well if you want to put a a compilation of both of our experiences (laughs) and i'm sure the rest of the game informer staff will have uh some funny recordings as well i had one where i was flying with like the wing and like three fans and I reached my destination. It was in a shrine. I reached my destination and I, so I jumped off and like, gl- like uh, paraglided down to like where you like finish the shrine. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, cool. I got it. And then the fan or the, the wing that I created came down and hit me and <laughs> took out like three of my hearts. And I'm like, Oh, good thing. I had like extra hearts because that would have been <laughs> hilarious to have that kill me and be like, Oh, well I have to do this shrine all over again now. Yeah. It's that, it's that hard thing. That's just like, I can't even begin to understand how you would begin to pull something like this off from a design perspective where like building is fun and you feel great when you do something successfully, but you almost like it better when something fails. Like when, mm-hmm. if you, you're trying to put something together and you're like, I think this will work. And then it fails spectacularly. Like that ends up almost being even better than it working successfully. Like, I, I don't, I, I don't know if it's like the physics of link falling or something like that, just make it so much more funny, but like, uh, it's just so good. It just, it's like, you, you just, you win either way. You either complete the puzzle and you're proud of yourself or it falls apart spectacularly. And it's hilarious. Like either way you win. So, I mean, going to that conversation with uh, Aonuma and Fujibayashi, I asked them like about kind of the early stages. Wait, and, like, real quick, they... did you just just uh, to click? Did you say their roles? Aonuma's producer, Fujibayashi's yeah, Aonuma's the producer, and Fujibayashi's the director. Both of them had those roles for both Breath of the Wild and mm-hmm. Tears of the Kingdom. So it's uh, yeah. I, I brought up like you know kind of the early stages and like when they were making breath of the wild, did they know that they were going to have a direct sequel to that game? Because, you know, there's a lot of seeds planted in breath of the wild that come to fruition in tears of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And really they, they they were kind of like, yeah, we were getting kind of the end. This is Fujibayashi's talking about like, we're getting to the end of development on breath of the wild. And I was kind of like, you know, we could probably do something cool within this world and like do a direct sequel and they said they had a lot of ideas that were left over from Breath of the Wild. They they thought they could do um, with Tears of the Kingdom or with, with the, the sequel that eventually became Tears of the Kingdom. And one of the ideas that Fujibayashi said that he brought to Aonuma to kind of pitch a, a sequel was a, an approximation of what Ultra Hand would ultimately become. And okay. he, basically what he did was he, he said that he took like these elements from the world and made like kind of a cylinder and he said he he put like something he put a remote bomb from Breath of the Wild within that cylinder and then put other materials in there and the explosion of the remote bomb within the cylinder would shoot the thing out and he was like oh yeah well like, you know if we make the cylinder you can and throw the bomb in there you can make kind of like a cannon and you know he was like well, we just need like the and he made like a video and presented it to Aonuma and he was like we just need like kind of the uh, like uh, the means to give players like ways to assemble these items and assemble these, these objects within the world. And that ultimately is going to give us like the basis of like a a whole new experience and a whole new game. And then obviously like the scope 
just became huge after that. But like, right. you know, that yeah. was the initial pitch was like, look, if we could have some way to let players build within the world, there's a lot of cool stuff that they could really do. Yeah. I mean, players were kind of figuring out ways to do it already. Like with like, they were like, you know, using magnesis to lift carriages to float them around and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Like, I, I can't imagine that they, you know, I, I imagine they looked at that stuff and they're like, oh, well, this is what players are doing with this. Like, let's expand their tool set and just like give them even more options, you know? Yeah. And I mean, really, like the big thing that they said, because I asked, like, how did this challenge you as game designers, like all these new powers that Link has? And they were like, you know, like they directly referenced um, Ascend as like maybe the most impactful because that changed the way you explore Hyrule so much. And then they oh, were like, time, yeah. You know, like you can go through any any roof or any ceiling and it's like, how do we make it so that like there's not a, a significant load time that like you're going to come out and the, the game's not going to be like have all the textures populated or how are we going to make it so that like puzzles aren't just easily solved through like looking up and be like, oh, I can just go through the ceiling and that that fixes that problem that I've had. Yeah, or, the answer to that question, by the way, was make the ceilings impossibly tall. <laughs> <laughs> that is one way. And then the other one was like, how do we make it so like you don't go through the ceiling and then you come out and there's just nothing there? So mm-hmm. it's like there were a lot of problems that Ascend had to had to address. And they, they said that like, you know, that may have been the hardest one to implement. But Ultra I mean, Hand that's... also solved a lot of pro- or had a lot of problems where they were like, yeah, we got to like make sure the islands are like the right distance apart and that ended up being a, a big challenge for them. Yeah, I, I'm really happy to hear that about, well, not happy, I, maybe that's the wrong term, but I'm, I think it's really cool to hear them talk about Ascend that way mm-hmm. because I think there was a fear, I, I, a justifiable fear from players early on that it's like, wait, you're just in Hyrule again? Like, you're just in the same place? And ultimately, to you know, to put your fears to rest, like, it really does not feel like a retread at all. And I think a big part of that is Ascend because Ascend they've adjusted the world so much for you to use Ascend and take advantage of Ascend. And as I was playing, I was almost feeling like, again, specifically because of Ascend, I was kind of like, I, this almost seems like this was harder to implement in the old version of Hyrule than it would have been to just start from scratch. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. I'm not a designer. I don't know. Maybe if we asked them that question directly, they would say like, oh, no, 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 no. It was definitely easier to to do it this way than to make something completely new. But like, I can't even imagine like them looking at every inch of Hyrule and 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 how they figured out how to make a send to work everywhere. You know, like I can't even begin to sort of think about that process. It just seems impossible. Yeah, I actually did ask them about oh, like how I'm trying to find the answer within my interview right now. Um, I have not transcribed it yet, but I do have kind of a, an AI transcription of it. Um, but like he said, it's a little bit different in terms of the types of difficulties and hardships that we encountered with this. Uh, because like, and basically, like the gist of it was like, you know, when you're diving straight up and down, like from the Sky Islands down to Hyrule, it, you move at such a faster pace right. that like you basically fly through Hyrule at that point. But then if you were just kind of running from one point to another, but like, you know, that was a, a unique challenge for them to have to solve is like, all right, well, how do we make it so that like you're not just like skyrocketing from the the top of the sky islands all the way down to the surface like how they had to like you know make it so it was a lot of verticality in this game but also make it so it wasn't just an unreasonable amount of verticality and then like i said making sure like the distance between it was was uh the right amount um to so like when you're going from one island to the next it's not an impossible leap or an impossible thing to build and then of course all the caves and everything uh added a bunch of depth to the the pre-existing Hyrule. So like, it's just like, you know, they, you can see the full answer in my interview on GameInformer.com right now, but like it basically the, the, the short answer was it was a lot of work, uh, but like in a different way than if we were just to build a whole new Hyrule. Yeah. I mean, it had to be a lot of them playing around in, in the game they created with these new tools and like, r- like moving things around and like adjusting them. Like that's why it almost seems harder. You know, it, it seems harder to just like, 
take the thing that already exists and make it amenable to these new tools. Like it's, it's a testament to their, what they're able to do. It's, it, it came out incredibly well. And it's a fact, good game. Yeah. It, it's a great game in case we haven't said that already. Uh, and you haven't gotten that sense from the, the, the tone of our conversation and Kyle's 9.75 out of 10 review. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, right. it, it, it's a very, very good game. Uh, one of the best games on the switch. One of my favorite Zelda games overall, which, you know, it's my favorite series. So it, uh, yeah, God, that's going to be, that's, that's the, the, the sort of forthcoming conversation is like, where, do, where does this stand compared to breath of the wild and all uh, that stuff? It's going to be an interesting conversation. It's, it, it's something that I'm not quite ready to get to because I'm still playing through. It's still consuming the content that it has to offer. Yeah. Uh, speaking it, of, it's also con- so strange to just play a proper sequel. Like there have been sequels in the Zelda canon before, but not this direct, like never, like even, cause even if you look at wind waker to, um, uh, the, the DS one, whose name I can't recall off the top of my head, which is like a direct sequel. Like you moved between platforms you there. Phantom so, Hourglass. Yes. Phantom Hourglass. Like you moved between platforms. So like, Phantom Hourglass really felt different um, from Wind Waker and Majora's Mask felt truly different from Ocarina of Time because of its structure. But this like this picks up the story. I don't know. uh, Two years after the ending of Breath of the Wild, something like that. Like, I don't know the exact timeline, but it's like we've never really had a, a, a core Zelda sequel like this. It's wild. Yeah, well, I asked them about that as well. Like, hey, like this is a series that doesn't typically get a lot of direct sequels. What did you learn from like the lessons of developing other direct sequels in this franchise, like Majora's Mask, A Link Between Worlds, were the two that like they specifically referenced? They're like, oh, you know, sure. we were we were basically restructuring those original games in the format of the the sequels, whereas with this, like, we were expanding so much. So it was like we had to kind of keep all the stuff that was in the original game, but expand upon it in like just massive ways. So it was like a, uh, it was more less of a like, Hey, we can take these direct lessons. I mean, of course, like in 2019, when I, when I talked to AJ Aonuma about like, you know, immediately after I asked him, like if he was giving himself more time to create this game than he did with Majora's mask. And he laughed and said, absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that seemed like the big answer <laughs> that he gave yeah. me in 2019. I mean, I think this is, Right, the longest gap between any mainline Zelda between Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Am I do I have that wrong? Uh, is it? I mean, it's there's been some pretty substantial gaps. I mean, the Wii U didn't even get its own uh dedicated Zelda game, right? Yeah, well, like, it did. It's called The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but that's not the only like we went the entire yeah. Wii U lifespan. And then some, because yeah. the Skyward Sword came, I guess the 3DS got Link Between Worlds during that time. So yeah, Skyward Sword was 2011, Breath of the Wild was 2017. But so Link like Between years. Worlds was 2013, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, but I, I'm talking about console, okay. like mainline console, which is like, admittedly, like a, just an asterisk I'm inventing for myself. But yeah, it, that might be 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20. So yeah, I guess uh, Skyward Sword, Breath of the Wild, and Breath of the Wild to Tears of the Kingdom were about the same gaps. Okay. Yeah. I mean, hey, it makes sense. Like we're uh, <laughs> these games are getting enormous. <laughs> yeah, take your time. I don't care. Yeah, as long as they're great. Like you know, I don't mind waiting every five to seven years for this game. I, I, of course, I would love more Zelda games to play. Make it a flat ten. Let's do it once a decade. <laughs> exactly. Um. So one of the big things about this game, and this is not a, uh, I don't think we can consider this a spoiler because Nintendo themselves have come out and said it. There are dungeons in this game, like yes. distinct environmental environment based dungeons. How did you feel about those? I mean, there's, there's uh, the four main ones that we can talk about, I would say, um, but we're not going to go into details about what they are, but like overall impressions of those dungeons and what they bring yeah. to the table. Yeah. No spoilers. Um, I liked them more than Breath of the Wild. Um, I liked them less than the dungeons from, you know, linear Zeldas, right? Like I'll take a sky, I'll take a Twilight Princess dungeon over a Tears of the Kingdom dungeon, if that makes sense. Um, but I, they, they're simplified, uh, in, in a good way, right? They're like, may, they're easier to understand, and I think that one thing that they do is they take advantage of 
like uh distinct abilities more directly mm-hmm. you know like and and that extends to the bosses and i and the bosses are very cool the bosses are distinct and interesting and like the the sort of combat scenarios you find yourself in when you're taking them on rely more on specific tools which i like because like that was one thing that was a little bit of a bummer about breath of the wild is like the bosses were cool but they all kind of look the same they all look very similar Mm -hmm. and like they also you could kind of beat them all the same way you know if you just like had a lot of arrows and some good swords you were all set where that's not necessarily the case here and I and I'm just really butting up against the the spoiler line there, but um, I overall I think it, that they're all an upgrade from the Breath of the Wild dungeons. Yeah, I, I would agree with you as as well. Like, I feel like the Divine Beasts in Breath of the Wild were often my least favorite parts of that game. Like I would, yeah. I would like on both playthroughs that I've done of that game, I'm like, all right, cool, I'm just gonna go explore and everything, and then eventually I'm like, I guess I should go do the Divine Beast yeah i'd rather do like 10 shrines uh than the one dungeon but that's not that's like not to say they're bad or anything it's just like the weaker it's a weak part of an otherwise stellar game Mm -hmm. but uh yeah i i mean what do you are you kind of on the same page right you like them more in tears of the kingdom i think i like i like them more yes i think think they're actually it's funny because i played the dungeons in an order that made sense to me, but maybe is a little bit different from how other people will play them. And I think that I liked the bosses less and less. Like, I I think I liked uh, the first boss I played. I was like, Oh, I love this, this boss. The second one, I was like, Oh, I like this less, but it's still fun. And then the third and the fourth one, I just didn't much care for. Mm, Okay. Um, I I thought they were kind of more frustrating than fun. Um, one of them maybe less so, but one of them for sure I was not a big fan of, but still like it, it's a small part of the game. I'm still extremely high on this game. I'd probably, if I was reviewing it based on my playthrough, I'd probably give it the same score. So it's not like it, it's so bad or anything like that. It's just yeah. a weaker part of a, of an incredible experience overall is kind of what I'm trying to get at. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that overall the temples or dungeons or whatever they're called are an upgrade over um over what we got with the divine beasts and tears of the kingdom yeah or, uh, breath of the wild see now i'm doing the opposite early on i couldn't call tears of the kingdom tears of the kingdom i would always be like oh yeah breath of the wild i mean tears of the kingdom right. now i'm doing the opposite where i'm calling breath of the wild tears of the kingdom right right exactly yeah but we'll never figure it out we'll never get we're, it uh, we're gonna talk story right now but keeping in mind sensitive to spoilers Right. What were your overall thoughts of this story? Uh, good. Liked the story. Liked the early conceit for the game that gets planted, I don't know, pretty quickly. I'm trying to think of exactly when you know what's going on, you know, per se. And I thought it was a good hook of like, okay, so that's sort of the setup here. Okay, that's cool. I like that. I liked seeing it to the end. Uh, I, it doesn't r- really pushed the boundaries of Zelda's storytelling in a radical way but I really liked it and I thought the conclusion was thrilling and exciting and cool yes and uh again no details but no they take some big swings on this interesting I don't think they take big swings but we can't talk about that more than this (laughs) we'll have to revisit that I'm saying like with some of the uh, the character development, we'll say. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I Okay. I can see what you're saying there. All right. Yes. Um, <laughs> you have a better sense of the characters in this game. They actually are, you know, people with personality. Well, that's what I want to get to now is that like, you know, Link is still silent or aside from some grunts and yells and stuff. And hand motions when he responds. <laughs> Various hand motions. Which in the universe, are is he talking? Because they're like, hey, what's your name? And like he yeah, moves no, his hand. Yeah, 100% hands. he's talking. Yeah. yeah. But like we, it, we always see him as silent. Yeah, he's a silent protagonist, but he's absolutely talking to people. Yeah. Okay. He's not just just quiet. Zelda describes him in a journal in Breath of the Wild that he's just very quiet. Yeah, like it was once he took up like the mantle of like the the hero, he became like more focused, I think is what she said. Like ever since he got the Master Sword, like he's been quiet. And she was like, I think it's because he's so focused on his task or something. Yeah, which I like. I always I I love that in Breath of the Wild when you come across that journal. It's like, all right, yeah. 
give me a little context for why we got a solid protagonist, a silent protagonist here. I like it. But so Link, largely stoic still. I mean, still yep. expressive in the same ways that he was in Breath of the Wild. But Zelda is... Unless you play it how I did, which is just you don't wear pants. And then you just look like a total goofball <laughs> all the time. And they're like, oh, Link. He's always building ultra hand cars and driving around without pants on. <laughs> just running around in his underwear. Building... That's how I role play in, in so, Tears of the Kingdom. Talk to me about how you feel about like Zelda's personality in this one. Because I think a lot of people were kind of left cold by her personality in Breath of the Wild. Oh, that's funny. I, I actually, I, I still, I, I like Zelda's uh, personification in Breath of the Wild. I, I like uh, the story of her struggling to basically do the thing that she's fated to supposed to do. Like, that's kind of the crux of that story is like, I'm supposed to do this and I can't. And that's difficult for her. And I liked that. And then here she has a little bit more grasp on her abilities. She's like excited about learning about the history of the world. I I, I like her. She's she's not my favorite Zelda. I think my favorite Zelda is still Skyward Sword Zelda, um, just in terms of personality. But I really like I like um I like Breath of the Wild Tears of the Kingdom Zelda. And I think um I think she she. she her her sort of story d- does conclude nicely in Breath of the Wild. She finds herself I- in that game. Mm-hmm. So she's a much more uh, confident uh, person in this one, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's some really good scenes with her in this this game. Yeah. Um, and you get I think you get more of her in this game, if I'm not mistaken. Gosh, that's a good question. I think so. Yeah, I think you do. I mean, you don't get quite the character development of Breath of the Wild because she had the the benefit of starting at a at a low place and being able to climb mm-hmm. to the top, right? She doesn't really have that trajectory in Tears of the Kingdom, but she does. Um, she is in it a, a, a lot. You you she's in a lot of cutscenes. She talks a lot. Yeah. Now, what about the other side of the coin here with Ganondorf? How did you feel about this version of Ganondorf? I think that a lot of people really loved that version of Ganon in Breath of the Wild. Like, I think that that the the grotesque calamity Ganon that you fight at the end, followed by kind of the the victory lap that is the Dark Beast Ganon that yeah. you uh, you fight. I think that that felt appropriately epic, if not maybe a little bit uh, underwhelming in terms of like the difficulty at the end. However, like personality wise, how did you feel about Gandorf in this game? Um, he's this, this sounds so negative and, and I'm sorry, but, but he's fine. <laughs> I don't, he's, he's, he doesn't, I love the, his design. I love the way he looks. Uh, yeah, I guess to talk more about him would be a spoiler. I, he's he's fine he didn't like blow me away he was like yes this is a solid iteration of this villain that i've come to know by playing many zelda games and that that's usually with with zelda that's usually a product of like you don't really see his side of things ultimately he's he's just the sort of the hurdle to overcome see i liked this version of ganondorf a lot oh cool not quite to the point of like a wind waker but I think maybe probably more than Ocarina of Time. Yeah, he has more personality than Ocarina of Time. Yeah. But like less I, than Twilight Princess. Yeah, less than Twilight Princess. I, I think I'd probably put him on par, maybe a little bit below the Twilight Princess version in terms of how much I like this version. I think that the opening cut scene is just horrifying. Yes. God, yeah, I love so like the design. I just love like they, they've shown sort of the a proper Ganondorf in some trailers as well. And like, you know, dehydrated Ganondorf, like those I think look great. I love the way he looks. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I think uh voice actor, Matthew Mercer, he does a great job both with like, I guess kind of both of the voices that he has to put on both uh dehydrated Ganondorf and uh, I guess hydrated Ganondorf. <laughs> right. Um, You know, I think that that voice really suits the character well and it's a uh i don't know i think that every time every scene that there is with ganondorf i felt the impact of it and Mm. i I don't know if i could say that about a lot of other characters in zelda games yeah i i mean 
I I still think the voice acting in both of these games is is the maybe the weakest element honestly like the like i just don't know how successful it is in general across the board that includes zelda and ganondorf i just don't especially like when you look at other video games that exist i feel like the voice performances are are pretty pretty weak in see, these zelda games i could see it in some of the side characters or even in zelda i, I get that like the the zelda voice acting is very very divisive I think Ganondorf is very good. Like, I think that is the standout performance of this game. I'm glad you feel that way, Brian. <laughs> I don't think, I, and it's not like, I, I, they're not like bad. It doesn't bring the game down in any way. It's just like, I feel like we're just in this industry capable of better voice performances across the board, generally okay. speaking. Now, uh, there um, is one character who would be a spoiler to detail who I thought was a very good performance. Um, it was like one of the side characters, but otherwise uh, it, it it felt very perfunctory throughout for me. It's that weird goofball that's always holding up the signs, right? <laughs> I do like him. He's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, he's I like every time I ran into him, I was like, yeah, man, I'll help you out. What you doing? What, what you need? <laughs> so, you know, get, get, I guess that transitions us nicely into the exploration of this world. Uh, there's one major thing that I don't do. We want to talk about the thing that we I guess we haven't talked about to this point. Uh, the game is out, so people are playing it, but, like, how sensitive do you want to be about, like, you know, we know about the Sky Islands, and we know about Hyrule, but what about the other thing? Um, I, I think we, we let's, let's not spoil anything. We will have plenty of opportunities in the future to talk about it in depth, right? I, I, I think I, um, uh, like, I, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want someone to stumble across this and, like, learn something that they don't want to learn. Fair enough. Like, okay. I don't know. Am I, am I being too sensitive? Do you think I'm maybe, being overzealous? I, I think people... Should we draw a line in the sand and say, hey, maybe you can fast forward this part? Like, do we want to do that kind of thing? Yeah, let's let's just... This is a very, this is a very loosey-goosey episode. It is. Yeah, we're, we're not following any kind of, like, outline. We're just kind of talking about our love of this game and uh, and apparently Kyle's hatred of the voice actors in it. Jeez. I hate it. No, they're lovely people. I've... I've I... <laughs> I think they are good voice actors. I just think that the the, the performances are weak in this game in particular. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I uh, feel that way. <laughs> but like, I guess we'll suffice to say this Hyrule is so much bigger than I could have ever imagined. I, I brought this up with, uh, with Aonuma and Fujibayashi and I was just talking like, when Breath of the Wild came out, like we were all like, oh my God, this Hyrule is so massive. Like, it's too I big. I can't even wrap my mind around how big it is. Then you have that plus just layers upon layers like how did you approach this version of hyrule i guess like when you first went in because i know i know myself i was intimidated oh yeah i mean there's there's parts of this map that i was just like scared to even engage with <laughs> right because mm -hmm. i was like oh i don't know if i'm ready for all that i still have to check in with all my friends in hyrule before i start getting into to, to, to new stuff you know mm -hmm. flying around in the sky and that kind of thing what's going on in kakariko let's let's check in there before i'm <laughs> exploring new places you know yeah i mean it it's just absurd how large this world is and like I don't even know where to start with it, but like, I guess the sky islands, like how did you feel about like kind of going up into the sky, exploring this new frontier, all the stuff that brings to it. And like, I don't know, just Island hopping essentially over, over Hyrule. Yeah. I, I love that stuff. Like I, that's, that's where like ultra hand really sings to me mm -hmm. are the moments where you're trying to get from one Island to another. I, I love it. It's also just so thrilling. I actually never really encountered a situation that they sort of teased in some of the early, like one of the early, the only, or I guess, gameplay showcase where uh, a, a bad guy knocked Link off the island and he fell to the ground. Like I, there was this fear in me that I was like, oh, you're going to like fall off all the time and you're going to have to like figure out how to get back up there and that's going to be a pain. I never really ran into that as, and I mean that in a positive way. Like there was never an instance where maybe i was just extra careful right maybe maybe other players who are more laissez-faire will just like get knocked off all the time and it'll be frustrating but like i appreciated that it's like you, you can stay up there pretty easily and like it's fun to try to formulate ways to move from island to island like that that's the the puzzle in itself of just getting from point a to point b is just always super fun to solve yeah i mean I, it happened to me a couple of times actually 
Uh, one of which was a, a time where I was like, I really wish I put a travel medallion down because All right, you were sure, it was yeah. a very difficult spot to get to. And thankfully, I was able to like paraglide back over and like kind of grab like the, the ground that was hanging beneath the island and climb back up. But like, I was like, you've got to be kidding me when it happened because I did not want to have to like traverse back up to there because there was no like shrine or fast travel point or anything that I had unlocked anywhere close to it. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so thankfully like that happens most of the time. And I think that like, you know, that was probably a thing that Aonuma knew was going to happen in that gameplay showcase where he was just like, I'm just going to let him hit me off of the, oh, uh, yeah, the of island. Course. But I mean, that's, it's also that thing that the game does so successfully where it's like, there is joy in failure. You know, it's like, if you fall off, like it's still kind of fun, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I've, I've discovered shrines that way where I'm just like, okay, I'm going to fly from this. Island. I'm going to build a little, like little plane and fly from this island to that island. And it turns out I don't have enough like battery to get right. from the, get to the island. I'm like, well, maybe I'll be able to glide. And it's like, nope, I am nose diving right now. <laughs> and so I just will start skydiving and I'll be like, oh, there's like three shrines in this vicinity. Let me oh, go hit those up. And I, it's just that exploration and that discovery is still there. And it's amazing. That first moment, maybe you had like, I have genuinely had an involuntary smile on my face. That very first time you move from the sky islands down to the ground and you're falling for quite a while to just like look around and see shrines. And you yeah. could like on that first trip down, I marked like five shrines, like on my way down. Well, that's to the, the maximum ground. you can mark, right? Or whatever. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it was only three or four, but it was like, it was just like, it was perfect. It was like this. It was that same. It, it's similar feeling to the first time you, you know, get off the plateau in breath of wild where you're like, what's that? what's that? Oh, I'm going to go over there later. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, I don't know what that is. I'm going to see what that is. And it's like, yeah, it's just so they, they, you really feel it again. in those, in that first drop to the ground. Yeah. It's again, it's just an immense Hyrule, like so much. And I feel like Hyrule itself is just as dense as it was in breath of the wild in terms of like areas that you can go around and still discover new little things maybe even more dense because like now there's like building challenges and mm. like there's like stockpiles of items that you can like can like construct a thing with or whatever like you know and now i'm gonna make a little car that i can drive around in if if you want to yeah i love i love the sort of conceit of that too like that there's just crap everywhere for you to build with is that they're working on rebuilding hyrule after the calamity you know, it's they like just can't so catch a break. They, but but I just love that. I, I, I always appreciate the little sort of narrative conceits like that of like, oh, you wonder why inexplicably there's like, you know, pallets of wood everywhere now. It's like, well, yeah, they're rebuilding Cairo. Like, <laughs> of course, they would. there. There's a whole there's construction companies like littered throughout the whole land. I, I just like that kind of stuff. Yeah. What which power took you the longest to be like, why am I not using this? Um. Pro probably uh, ascend is the one that i kind of like i have the spoiler free tips guide on the site right now and it was one of those things where i kind of had to like be like don't forget about ascend like because there were a lot of instances where i was like i don't know how to get out of here and then it took me a minute to be like oh right i can just use ascend you know mm -hmm. i will say the one that i probably end up using the least was recall yeah same um, here which is like, it works great. There's some really cool puzzle solving opportunities with it, but it's, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's very specific instances where you're going to use it, you know, like you'll use it to return, uh, like a boulder thrown at you from an enemy. You'll use it to make a rock go into the sky and then you'll use it in shrines for puzzles. But beyond that, I didn't really use it a ton. Yeah. I was um, right there yeah. with you with that one. Um, the one for me, and yeah, Ascend was definitely the one where I was just like, I I would be like looking at like, all right, how do I climb this? And like, am I going to have enough stamina to get there? And I'll be like, oh, dummy, there's a flat ceiling right there. Let me go over yes. and see if I can ascend yeah. through that. And a lot of times you could. The one that I took, I think took me the longest to really fully embrace was Fuse. Because I was like... I'm not finding any good weapons. What the heck is going on here? Like, why am I finding like, all right, these, this sword, it's rusty. It has seven attack. It's like, this is garbage. Like what's going on here? Uh, oh, okay. So you weren't, okay. I see where you're getting at. And yeah, then I was yeah. like, oh, well I have like 40, like 
Lizalfo horns or whatever. Let me just like drop that on the ground and see what happens if I fuse it to this. Oh, that makes my attack now like 23 or whatever. And it's like, oh, I, I should be doing this all the time. And sure enough, that's what I like. I don't think I by the time I beat the game, I didn't have like one single weapon in my inventory that wasn't fused in some way. Right. And yeah, it's it, it, it takes takes kind of a while to like not not really a while, but like, yeah, one one thing to know going in is like just fuse all your weapons. Like it basically lets you hold twice as many weapons, kind of, you know? Yeah. And I mean, also, it adds a lot of properties to it. Like the base example of like, hey, we have a sword and we can fuse a rock to the end of it. Now we can smash walls and like or, or like, you know, cracked walls. And it's like, yeah, that's super important. But there's other stuff that like it will deal other like effects and everything. And you can not only fuse like monster parts to your weapons, which was my, I think, primary fusion was like taking like a bacoblin horn and fusing it to the top of a, a sword and making it a lot stronger. But like putting like Zonai devices on it would, mm -hmm. would sometimes do some cool effects. Like you can put a, yeah. <laughs> a flamethrower on the end of your sword and like swing and like have like flames go flying off on it or there also, there are, shield. I, again, veering into spoiler territory, but there are also like big Zonai items that you can fuse. I was like, oh, I didn't know I could fuse that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there are some there's some really cool stuff um, and they, they do a good job of experimenting with the Zonai devices, not only in the shrines, but like there was a, a mini game that I found that was like, hey, we want to see how creative you can get with this. I'm not going to tell you what the mini game is, but it was like, here's what you need to do. We want you to see how good you can do it. <laughs> and yeah, like, right, right. And I was like, OK, well, let me play with this for a little bit. And then eventually I was like, I need to make progress in this game, actually. But like I could have spent like an hour putting together like a contraption that was going to accomplish the task that I needed to accomplish there. And it, it's like they know full well the open endedness of these mechanics. And like they have yeah. embraced it with like little activities for you to do both in the shrines and also like out in the world. Yeah, I didn't I didn't like call it out. I didn't put it in my review or anything because it's not relevant to my experience. And honestly, it's probably not going to be relevant to your personal gameplay experience when you play Tears of the Kingdom uh, in terms of like reviewing it and being critical of it. But like I, there I am very excited to see what people do with Ultra Hand because like I, you know, I wasn't ultimately super creative. And I didn't even really go as far to test the boundaries of the thing. I don't know if you did. Did you see like did you try to figure out how many items you could attach? I didn't. I was mostly just yeah, trying to like solve the puzzles. I, I did try like a little bit of like, oh, what would happen if I do this and this? And usually it ended up with me getting shot into oblivion. And right. <laughs> like I tried like, I, I don't want to get like the spoilery part, but like there is a, an island where I was like, hey, let me see what happens if I just like attach a bunch of springs and rockets together and like get on top and like hit them and set them all off at once. And it ended up that I just went flying way up into the sky and, uh, you know, ended up dying. But <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> but yeah, so like that was often like the way. But I'm sure there's like really cool stuff that people are going to do. I'm, just, I'm so excited for that, like for this community that like had such creativity with Breath of the Wild. I'm excited for them to get their hands on these tools because like yes. this is like Breath of the Wild. It was like, yeah, we're you can do whatever you want, like within these like this tool set. But I feel like breath, like Tears of the Kingdom is like, have at it. Like, here's like a playground for you to just go wild with, basically. Yeah, like if if Breath of the Wild's big in innovation, quote unquote, was like exploration, like you've never played a game that quite gave you as much opportunity to explore as this. Tears of the Kingdom's, I think, legacy is going to be like I, the creativity, right? It's exploration is still a massive part of Tears of the Kingdom, but it's like have do, the creativity is what feels like the big uh, revelation here. And not only that, like they kind of do a good job of like having the game be like, Oh, I know what you're going for. And like trying to like just yeah. snap it into the place, but like, it's not like a snap system, right? No, but it does. It what, what I love it because it's like other games that have attempted this, like uh, Marcus and I are playing um, uh, Banjo Kazooie Banjo nuts and bolts. Uh, we're super replaying or we're streaming it every week right now and that game is very cool and like how you can create vehicles and how you can adjust them and stuff like that but it does rely on you sort of thinking practically about your machines and making sure wheels connect to uh, steering wheels and like ammo caches connect to guns right you kind of have to like 
get everything to line up properly for things to work. But in Tears of the Kingdom, it's like much more fluid. It, like you said, it kind of knows what you're trying to make. So like you can just pop four wheels on a platform and a steering wheel. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. You, you can drive this thing now. You know, like it doesn't, it's not worried too much about like, yeah, make sure you connect, you know, this element to this element so that the the wheels actively connect to the steering wheel and make sure the plat. it's like, it's, it, it, it really takes care of a lot of that sort of logic for you to let you just sort of create weird things. Like it, do, it never takes super long to create just like a vehicle that you can drive, which I, which I really appreciate. Have you ever seen those videos where like people are being stupid with fireworks and they fall over and they like shoot into the the group and like everybody's running. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> yeah. That happened to me in this game. Like I was putting together a contraption. This is one of the times I was being kind of creative. And there was something that was like shooting out projectiles and I attached it to this thing and I was trying to like set it up so it would go where I needed it to go. And it fell over. <laughs> and next thing I know, these projectiles are flying at me and I'm Ooh. running for my life and it almost killed me. Yeah, I tried. They, there's these things. There's like uh, bombs that you can time delay. It's like a Zonai device where you can like hit a bomb and it'll explode a few minutes later. Um, was not prepared to work with those in the way I thought I was. Oh, no. I was like, let me try using some of these for some weird things. It's like, oh, no, no, this is, you're not ready for this. <laughs> yeah, that was ultimately what actually because there's a little bit of force that it push, pushes off when you activate that, like when the bomb right. goes off. And I thought it was just going to activate the Zonai device. I didn't think it was actually going to like cause any Explore. movement. And that's what <laughs> caused it to fall over and start shooting the projectiles at me. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, there's a lot of ways that you can kill yourself in a lot of interesting and funny ways. Yeah, um, it's good. It's good stuff, y you know. So with uh, this game, like, you know, there's so much added to it, but there's also some really cool quality of life stuff. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the smallest, but also the most valuable one that like, fr like, I, I think I said this somewhere else too, like it should have been implemented into Breath of the Wild, frankly, like it should have just been an update that they issued is if you have the max amount of swords or shields or whatever, uh, and you open a chest that has a sword that you want in it, it lets you just drop one of your old swords without having to like leave the chest, right? It's so helpful. It's like it's so small, but it makes such a big difference. Because in the past, you had to open a chest. Oh, nice sword in there. It's like, oh, I want that sword. Okay, let me close everything down. Let me now. I have to walk away from the chest and decide what I want to drop. And maybe that meant going into the pause menu, or maybe that meant if it was a sword, you could at least throw it. Mm -hmm. um, but here, it just it all happens like very seamlessly, and it takes like half a second. Uh, and I and I love that. <laughs> I do love that when you go into the kind of the quick access menus in your uh, using the D-pad, you can just sort on Zonai devices if you want. Right. Yes. Or most used. Like that That was so helpful for me for most used. Because it's like, all right, I'm using a lot of bright bloom seeds or I'm using a lot of bombs or I'm using a lot of fire fruits. And it's yeah. like, that's nice that all of those are right there and like the start if you sort by that way. I think we talked about it on Game Informer show, I, th I believe, right? But like, I that's like a little thing that I'm excited to see from other people. Is like, what was your most used stuff? You know, I bet it's a lot different than mine. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I just named off three of mine. <laughs> yeah, I think mine are bright bloom. I actually use uh, flint and wood a lot to like okay. make little fire pits and stuff like that, and bombs, uh, bomb flowers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's going to be some that everybody uses. I mean. I, I bet Bright Bloom Seed's going to be at the top of a lot of people's lists. <laughs> I would say so. But uh, yeah, I, I, it's uh, the sorting is. I, I do kind of wish you could select a handful of favorites, though, right? Like, even if they're not ones you use all the time, like, I, I wish I could just, like, pick, like, I just want all these always up front. You know, it kind of does that for you automatically, but mm -hmm. it would be nice to have a little sort of control over that. There's also the other big quality of life one that I would say, aside from the travel medallion, which carries over from the uh, the Breath of the Wild DLC, where you can just kind of create your own fast travel points once you unlock that. Yeah, that's nice. There's also the uh, recipe cards, which I thought were a huge help because like you could just yeah, once yeah. you discover a recipe, like by creating it, or I think there are some areas around that you can actually like find a recipe in the world well you can also i think it's like if you buy you know a potion from the goron shop oh. like you get it, i think it, once it's in your inventory you see the recipe i think interesting 
Um, but yeah, it, there's just like you can select an item to hold, like if you were cooking in Breath of the Wild, or you can like choose select for recipe and it'll bring up a list of all the recipes that you have made with that ingredient. And then you can just select it. And if you select a recipe, it will get, it will just make you automatically hold all of the ingredients that you have in your inventory that were a part of that recipe. So if, even if like, oh, I did like, you know, f- this fish with this mushroom with this herb and then rock salt to really like make it better and yeah. you don't have any rock salt, it'll still put the three things you do have in your inventory in your hands. So if you want to add it, something else to it or modify it in some way, you can do that easily. And that is so smart because like there's one time where I was just like, oh my God, what was that that thing that I made that gave me like, you know, three bonus hearts plus full recovery and I can go into my recipe. I was like, I know it had like the raw gourmet meat. Go in there, look at that and be like, oh, it was this one. Oh, I don't have that recipe or I don't have that that particular ingredient. So I could go somewhere and where I knew a bunch of that ingredient was and, you know, stock up and then have all those like really good cooked meals in my inventory for like a, a difficult stretch. Yeah, it's one of those instances, kind of like what we're talking about with the chest, where it's like that that probably should have been in Breath of the Wild. I like you kind of got to think about like what was their reasoning mm. to not let you have the recipes. And I think they probably just wanted players to just constantly be experimenting with different foods is what I would, you know, just assume. But it is nice. And, they, you know, they probably didn't want people to just find one recipe they that, you know, gave a ton of hearts and just make a million of those. Mm hmm. But like, man, it's just it's just useful. Like, it's just it's it just makes it a little smoother, you know? Yeah. Oh, Kyle, this game is very good. Yeah. <laughs> like even like we so we streamed it that we're recording this on Thursday before launch, but we streamed it right when the embargo lift for 30 minutes. And it was just the introduction sequence. And just watching you play that, I was like, man, I cannot wait to dive back into this yeah. and play more, even though like I am so far removed from that intro sequence. I like I'm about 65 hours as of now. You're about 80 hours. It is it's just such a great game. It's exactly what I wanted from a sequel to my favorite game of all time. Like I'm not disappointed in the least. No, yeah, and I, I actually really I think it benefit. I think it maybe I already said this, but I think it actually benefits a lot from taking place in the same Hyrule. Um, like there would have been a certain amount of uh, like just new explorative opportunities to, you know, have a whole new starting from scratch world, but the sort of the the familiarity that a lot of us have generated from playing Breath of the Wild is actually like ends up being a benefit to when you play this game because it's like you kind of know where it is but it, it all feels a little different and you move around differently like i i actually like that it takes place in the same hyrule because it's such a great setting mm-hmm. uh, not all games can get away with that like for sure like there are a lot of great open world games where if the sequel just took place in the same place with some adjustments i think i would be boring or frustrating it, you know i.e crackdown 2 from back in the day but like it just it really works here it absolutely does. And by the way, I did uh, at the very end of my interview bring up the Skyward Sword situation where I asked Al Numa in 2019 if there was ever a hope for a Skyward Sword without motion controls. <laughs> and his quote was, I think that's close to impossible. And uh, I brought that up and asked him, like, hey, what changed? <laughs> and he was like, you know, when we had that interview, I probably did think it was impossible. But then, like, you know, once an idea gets in my head, like, I and like, I think it's a challenge. I, I kind of start thinking about like ways we can address that challenge and we found a good answer yeah you know you should have said after that he's looking for a challenge right you should have been like oh you know what i bet would be really hard on numa putting wind waker and twilight princess on switch (laughs) that would that's near impossible there's no way you guys could ever do that i i wanted to ask that so bad but i had already like kind of used up my non tears of the kingdom because they were like hey we're sticking tears of the kingdom my non tears the kingdom question went to uh skyward sword to yeah, ask him about little, that because that was like a, per, a personal moment with him about the the motion control thing yeah a little like uh behind the scenes is like we, when you go into those kind of interviews like it's like we're gonna talk tears of the kingdom like if you at like brian you totally could have asked him about wind waker and twilight princess but you would have just gotten like uh oh we have nothing to announce at this time mm-hmm. you know <laughs> but like you maybe you the, the trick is you tack one of those on the end of your <laughs> your interview session to, to try and get something but uh i i think you made the right call to spend more time on tears of the kingdom yeah and uh 
again, it, it totally would have been a no comment if I yeah, was absolutely. like, hey, yeah. Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, when's that coming? But I know. I it's a, the thing you got to realize in those kind of situations, it's like they're not going to inexplicably suddenly decide to announce this. So, like, yeah. it's, not, <laughs> it's not happening in your interview. I'm sorry. I wish it would, but it's just not going to happen. Especially when there's like a translator involved and like it, that means that everything takes double the time to say. And I have a very yes, limited time exactly. with these with these. Uh, very important people to one of the most important franchises in gaming history. Yeah, I'm excited to read that interview. I'm I'm, I'm glad you got to talk to them. That's really yeah. cool. You can go to GameInformer.com to not only read Kyle Hilliard's review of The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, but also a guide of what the Amiibos do, at least in our experience. You can do uh, spoiler-free tips from Kyle. Um, we're in the coming days and weeks, we're going to be updating some lists that we have from the Zelda franchise. Uh, what else? Video review. My mm-hmm. interview with Eiji Aonuma and Hidemaro Fujibayashi. Uh, lots of Zelda-related content over yeah, on GameInformer.com. Spoiler-free Game tips. I think we're going to do written and video version of that, so keep an eye yeah, out for that. Tons of stuff. If you want more of uh, Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, well, one, I'd recommend going and playing it. But two, you know, you can go to GameInformer.com. Plenty of content over there. Also, Game Informer show. We had a uh, slightly less in-depth but still every bit as fun of a conversation. Uh, Alex Van Aken and Marcus Stewart were asking tons of questions that I was like, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. And that was spoiler kind of like, free again, by the way, very much staying in spoiler free zone uh, early in Tears of the Kingdom's release. Don't want don't want to ruin anyone's experience with the game. I think eventually we're going to maybe do like kind of like we did when Aonuma did that, uh, that gameplay demonstration. We're going to do maybe a bonus episode. So w- w- that's going to be kind of like a spoilerific breakdown. Yeah. Of, like, yeah. When we happened. have some. When we have some folks, more people have beaten it. I think I would love to, yeah, have us all sit down and tie have a spoiler. Discussion. Yeah, we did that with Breath of the Wild. Um, yeah, back in 2017, I'd love to do it again with uh, with this game because there's a lot to talk about that we have not even scratched the surface of in this because we're trying to keep it as spoiler free as possible. But you know, yes, we will maybe be able to even go longer with the amount of stuff we haven't talked about because we're just trying to keep everybody. We're trying to respect everybody's approach to this game. I'm sure by the time you're hearing this, all the spoilers are already out on social media because people are uh, probably sprinting through this game that that came out less than 24 hours ago at this point. (laughs) But yeah, Kyle, anything else that we want to talk about with uh, Tears of the Kingdom before we wrap up here? Uh, No, I I think we're good, man. I I mean, for now, right? I'm excited for everyone to to play the game and share their experiences. I want to see what other people take away from the game. You know, do you think tears of the kingdom outsells breath of the wild? Ooh, that is a good question. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to say yes, mainly because of this long-term switch install base at this point. Mm-hmm. Right. Like uh breath of the wild is the best selling Zelda despite having launched on like a new system that was like hard to come by, but like pretty, I wonder the attach rate for Zelda is probably very high at this point, but Ooh, yeah, I long term. I maybe, maybe tears of the kingdom might outsell it. Yeah. I mean, in 2022, the, the last number, I'm just running it to the Wikipedia page real quick, 29 million copies on the switch. That was as of last year. And, uh, you know, when the switch came out, there was a 100% attach rate like that. When anybody who bought a switch bought breath of the wild as they should. Probably. And I think that, that, that was, <laughs> that was true for a lot of people who picked up the switch in the subsequent six years. Right. Like I think a lot of people like they were like, all right, what game should I get? I just got a switch. Yeah. It's I like, think well, I'm legally like, required to buy Mario Kart. Apparently yeah, Mario what Kart, else which do I need <laughs> one of the greatest selling games of all time at this point, Mario Kart eight deluxe. And you know, I guess Breath of the Wild and Super Mario Odyssey and Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, like those were the four games that, and I, now Animal Crossing probably as well. That's like the yeah, top Animal five Cross like there, must yeah. buy games for the Switch. Does Tears of the Kingdom even crack into that conversation of like, all right, this is like a top five game you need to buy on Switch? Gosh, man, I don't, I'm, now I'm like, even, I know I just said with some confidence that I was like, eh, yeah, I think it'll outsell it, but now I'm kind of like, eh, maybe it won't, but it'll sell very well. It'll It'll be a big hit for sure. Oof, yeah, I mean, top 10, we're going to say, right? Let me look yes. up. Yeah, I think top 10 is, is a, a reasonable, yeah. I'm going to look this up real quick. List of I bet it's like playing. top 10 is like, you know, Mario Kart. I bet the, I bet Stardew Valley's in there, you know. 
So right now, here's the top five of sales. These are the best selling Switch. Switch games. Mario Arms, Kart 8 Deluxe. Number one with a bullet. Arms. Uh, <laughs> so Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, number one. Animal Crossing, number two. Smash okay. Ultimate, number three. Breath of the Wild, number four. Pokemon Sword and Shield, number five. And Super Mario Odyssey, number six. Okay. Ooh, so Zelda outsold Mario Odyssey, huh? That's cool. By a, almost five million copies. Wow. Oh, I guess just over four million copies. Then okay. after that, it goes Scarlet Violet, Super Mario Party, New Super Mario Brothers U Deluxe, and Ring Fit Adventure. I think Breath of the Wild, or sorry, Tears of the Kingdom. Here, I am confusing the names again. I'm going to predict it lands number seven on that list. I think it's going to yeah. be behind Mario Odyssey. I think it could outdo a Mario Odyssey, I think. Even yeah, with I... the Mario movie kind of incentivizing a bunch of people to go buy mario odyssey at this point like people I, I th- went and saw the mario movie which is one of the highest grossing animated features of all time now yeah and they saw that and they said i want to play a mario game you don't think that's going to get a, a, an injection i it might have i don't think you're wrong but i still think tears of the kingdom will come out on on top does it outsell Thank pokemon you. sword and shield at number five no, I, I don't think so I think okay. it might not. So now I'm 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 sort of There's, I'm pulling I mean, back now where I said it's going to outsell Breath of the Wild. I'm, I've changed my opinion. I think it'll be up there. I think it'll be in the top 10. I don't think it's going to outdo Pokemon, though. So let me tell you something, Kyle. There's only 60,000 copies between Mario Odyssey and Pokemon Sword and Shield, according as really? of March 31st. I guess we'll have to you have to set a reminder to check in on this in like, I don't know, three or four months. Well, like a year, actually, because we're talking long term. Yeah. Right. I Maybe, think this yeah. is going to crack the top 10 May, very, very May quickly. May 11th, 2024. Let's try to so everyone remind us to look at this list again. Because <laughs> we got to give it some time, right? we got to give it a little time. How did it do in this first year? I think it's going to crack the top 10 very quickly. I think it's going to blast so, yeah. right past Ring Fit, New Super Mario Brothers U, and Super Mario Party. <laughs> New Super Mario Brothers U. God. Get that out of there. Hey, Swap that's... it with uh, 3D all... or not, um, 3D, what is it? World? 3D World. Yeah, let's get 3D World in there. What, so, are, yeah, what I... are we doing? What are we doing here? I think it's going to blast into the top 10 within its first week. Right, right. Pretty easily, yeah. I think. And then it's going to be kind of like a, a slow burn up the... I, I'm, I'm going to guess that it, it lands at number five, actually, right behind Breath of the Wild. Yeah. I, I wish, I wish we had um, box office numbers for video games the way we do for movies i wish they would share that stuff we only get it when they're good <laughs> right yeah and that's the other thing it's like all these numbers are based on just what they're willing to tell us you know well, i mean they have to like, report it somewhat accurately yeah. for investors and everything but even npd especially is uh, has all these asterisks of like you know like nintendo doesn't count like digital sales for npd and so i just it's it, it, it there's no i understand why it's, they don't share it like it's information that like i but i just it's just an interesting metric that I am jealous that movies have of yeah. just to, to like a, for of an entertainment sort of medium. I don't, I, I, I don't like seeing it used as an argument for a quality. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I don't, it doesn't, you know, a better movie that a worse movie that sold more tickets is not a better movie, but I just, it's, it's, I'm always curious to learn how people engage with entertainment media like that. And I wish we had the same opportunities for video games. So we don't, we, we, we kind of have to, poke around in the dark and see what we can figure out well nintendo always does a good job they don't do a good job reporting to the npd but they do a good job of giving their overall sales numbers for their top selling games which is always appreciated they usually will give you every earnings call every quarterly earnings call they will give a top 10 selling games on the switch okay. with updated numbers so that's always good and i think they include digital sales with that because you know they don't need to hide any numbers because they're the top selling games. So it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, we can make it look good if we combine both retail and digital. So that is something that I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to the next Nintendo earnings call, which I'm assuming will happen at the end of June. Cause mm-hmm. I think the latest numbers were at the end of March. So we'll have to see where they, uh, where they go from there. And that, that's when I think we're going to maybe see a, a bump in Mario game sales because you know, the Mario movie came out in the beginning of April. So we'll maybe mm-hmm. Mario, maybe we'll see Mario 3D World, Super Mario U, and uh, Mar- Mario Odyssey skyrocket up there. Or maybe we'll just see Tears of the Kingdom overtake all of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it deserves it. It's a great game. It's a very good game. Uh, anything else before we wrap up here, Kyle? No, I think we're good. All right. Well, thank you for joining me for this conversation again. We're planning a spoiler-filled conversation somewhere down the line, but we yeah, want to yeah. try to be respectful of everyone. 
uh, as they embark on this amazing journey. I hope you all enjoy it as much as we both have because it's uh, it's one of my favorite games on the Switch and one of my favorite Zelda games overall. Yeah, so. I, yeah, I think so. I'd have to give it a more time to have a conclusive decision, but yeah, it's up there. All right. Well, thank you so much to everyone for listening. Do me a favor if you haven't already, throw all things Nintendo a five star review and hit that subscribe button. And if you want to get any questions or comments in, you can get in touch with me at allthingsnintendo at gameinformer.com or hit me up on Instagram at Brian P. Shea. You can also join the Game Informer community Discord, which is a perk for subscribing to our Twitch channel even just for one month. Kyle, plug something online. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Okay. Kyle M. Hilliard. And I'm, also the I'm Game Informer TikTok. Yeah, yeah, still, still doing that, yeah. Um, just posted the Zelda review there this morning. All right. Well, that is our show for this week. Thank you all again so much for listening. Take care. We'll see you next time.